Hello, and welcome back to the Argyle HR Technology Leadership Forum. My name is Brittany Sullivan with Argyle. A couple of notes before I turn things over to our esteemed speaker. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsor's virtual booth at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. To ask questions throughout the session, simply type into the Q&A chat, and we will address your questions at the end of the session. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker, Jim Link, Chief Human Resources Officer at SHRM. We are excited to have Jim with us for his thought leadership titled, Why Employers Need to Think of AI as an Employee. Welcome, Jim, and over to you. Hey, thank you, Brittany. It's certainly a pleasure to be here with all of you today to discuss this very fascinating topic. It's all about the future. And one of the things we're going to talk about today is why we as employers need to think about AI as an employee. It's coming to get us and focus on us every day. And now is the time to really pay attention to all of the great things that are going to be happening out there. Now, in order to do this, we're going to kind of approach it at the following agenda. We're going to first of all talk about what's really happening out there with jobs and the fact that they're changing. They're not, they're not disappearing, they're just changing. And we know this because we can look back at history. Lots of change from automation and technological shifts in the past. And we'll explore some of those just to give you some context. We'll go a little bit deeper to understand what the difference is between artificial intelligence and automation, and then discuss what that role of automation and artificial intelligence is in this whole changing world of work that we're all experiencing. And then we'll talk about the leadership challenges and opportunities that lie ahead, as well as look at some forecasts for the future of artificial intelligence. Oh, you know, maybe five and 10 years out. Well, that's me. I'm the Chief Human Resources Officer at SHRM. I'm a futurist, I'm an advisor, I'm a consultant, and I spend a lot of time doing things like sharing knowledge and information on Twitter and on LinkedIn. So there's my Twitter handle and my LinkedIn um, address. So please follow me. I would love to share information with you. So let's first talk about what we're seeing out there, the fact that jobs are changing and they're not really disappearing. First, we know that AI itself is really just a technology that, that enhances and augments all of the things that we as humans do on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, it helps to free us up from some of the normal routine work that we do so that we can focus on the things that really matter, on the things that are important to us. That's what artificial intelligence actually is. We do know because of the widening use of artificial intelligence that a change is underway. And that change is going to be driven by the prolific and expanding use of artificial intelligence in nearly everything that we do. We know, for example, that it's going to continue to grow, but we also know that it's not gonna come and grab, grab your job. It's not like it's one of those things that's coming to take over the world. What we do know is that the share of jobs that are at risk for complete automation in just the next couple of years is only 1% of all the jobs that are out there. Now we've seen this represented several times and in several different ways across our organizations so that we understand that this data really is accurate. And it's not changing, artificial intelligence isn't, isn't taking jobs, it's changing the way that we work. And that's what we wanna talk about today. What we must understand as employers is that this really is more than just a balance between what a machine does and what we as humans do. This is a shift in the way that we think. And this means that embracing the idea of artificial intelligence as an employee is something that we need to be considering today, much like the way we think about the tools and technology that we use every day in our lives. For example, you drive a car to work every day. That is an essential piece of technology that it, at its core, is not really different than the artificial intelligence and the way that it will be applied and used in our everyday lives, both at home and at work. So it's more than a strategic uh, application of technology. It's a way of thinking and a new shift in mindset. So let's think about this a little bit differently. Let's think about this in its historical context and what automation and technology have done in the past. 
Well, we know that between 1850 and 1970, 92% of the jobs in this one particular industry disappeared. And the jobs in this industry disappeared because of the impact of technology and mechanization. So imagine that in that 120 year time period, 92% of the jobs in this industry disappeared. Well, that industry was agriculture. And today, Despite that loss of agricultural jobs, agriculture is more productive, produces more outcomes, and feeds more people than it did in the years prior to when all that job loss occurred. So that idea that technology is, can disrupt us without harming overall employment in any particular uh, country or even region of the world is clearly backed up by historical evidence. In this case, agriculture. So we see that happening more and more. It's not like all those farmers didn't learn new skills. They actually did. And when they learned those new skills, the economy actually continued to grow. That's exactly what we think we're going to see happen now. And not only will the economies grow, but we'll see more jobs created in those economies as well. Here's another example. Take a look at this particular quote. This quote said, today's new industries have comparably few jobs for those people who aren't very skilled. It's just the class of workers whose jobs are being eliminated by automation. You may be thinking, well, that, that sounds terrible and very, you know, looking down. Well, the fact is, is that that is from an uh, op-ed publication in Time Magazine from February 24th of 1961, more than 60 years ago. This was already being laid out and we know what's happened since then. Economies have continued to grow. More workers are working than ever, and more people have greater skills to do more things than they've done in the past. So all the great pro prognosticators who used to tell us all the scary things about what would be happening with automation have unfortunately, or fortunately, depending upon how you look at it, proven to be wrong. In fact, what happens with automation is we get more skilled, more capable, and create more jobs and more economic future. But in order to do that, of course, we have to sort and shift our mindsets a little bit and change the paradigms in which the way that we like to think and work. One of those paradigms that we always have is that it's human versus machine. In fact, that's not the way we want to think about it for the future. With the way we would like to think about it in the future is that these two things working together, humans and automation, are what create more opportunity, allow us to make better decisions, create more challenge for us to be able to over, challenges for us to be overcome. When you think about what happened with the deep blue supercomputer IBM and whenever it beat the world chess champion Gary Kasparov in 1997, people thought of that as the ultimate moment whenever machines would overtake man. Not true. Instead, what we found now is that in most cases, when machines present opportunities to man and then allow mankind to make better decisions, they're routinely able collectively to beat routine chess masters or defeat those chess masters every day. So in that scenario I just described, you have artificial intelligence, a chess engine machine would suggest a move, and then the human would decide whether they can accept or override that. move. So that collaboration, that human machine collaboration is certainly what we're going to be seeing more of in the future and it will be the thing that we need to think about as we outline how to best work with the differences between human and machine capability in the future. Now let's talk a little bit about artificial intelligence versus automation. Now, I don't wanna to go too deep here. I just wanna make sure that we understand the core elements of both of, the, of these concepts. So artificial intelligence actually refers to machines and systems and those types of things that can take some type of action based upon what they know, right? Or what they've been programmed to do. It's a broad and continually evolving range of technologies. It's not just one thing. Artificial intelligence actually works the best whenever it's a combination of things. And we also know that artificial intelligence and automation really are on a continuum. They're actually on uh, uh, different ends of that continuum where one, there requires significant human intervention on one end and almost no human intervention on the other. So it is the simulation of human intelligence designed in these categories that you see described on the screen in front of you. 
But then let's just take it one layer deeper when we talk about whether there's a human in the loop or not a human in the loop, in the loop and whether those are hardware, uh, hardwired in specific systems or adaptive systems. And what you can basically see is that we, if there's a human in the loop and we're talking about hard, hardwired systems, we ended up with what's called assisted intelligence, where that those systems help humans make decisions or take actions. And there's not a lot of learning or deep learning that occurs in these particular interactions. But then where those systems are adapted, you get augmented intelligence. And that's where those systems help human decision-making and continuously learn from those things that we do together. Then if you have no human in the loop, you end up with automation or autonomous intelligence. Some of the best ways to think about that with no human in the loop is what we're seeing today with self-driving cars and some of those types of things that are happening out uh, now or that we're trying to build the intelligence that can actually adapt to the environment and act autonomously without human assistance. Now we know there are some great success stories to those types of things. And we also know there are some things that we can be learning still from those types of interactions. But in a nutshell, you know, that's kind of the basic uh, bolts and nuts of how that these particular systems work. So let's talk briefly about artificial intelligence in the workplace today and what we see. We know that artificial intelligence employs, right? So what AI does the best around the world in almost every circumstance where that we have artificial intelligence. We know that AI employees are very, very good at predicting outcomes based upon the input that they receive. We know they're very good at providing alerts and insights to their human decision maker friends. We know that they're very good at identifying trends and sorting information and learning all kinds of things based on massive amounts of data, right? That's the best place to think about how that they survive and thrive is when there's massive amounts of data to be crunched and, and analyzed and utilized for the betterment of their human friends and coworkers. We know that there's some great applications to this happening out there already. For example, we know that HR departments are finding new ways to do record keeping and ensure people are learning and training and onboarding effectively can speed their way to productivity. We know that insurance companies are automating and expediting claims and processes. And we know that companies across the board, no matter what they're doing, are kind of getting rid of that manual customer data entry way of thinking that they've had to do off and on uh, for probably over the course of their lifetime as a company. So we know that some of these current AI applications are already reflecting the strengths that artificial intelligence brings to the marketplace. But we also know there are some things, some really important things where human employees excel and that are not yet replicable with their artificial intelligence friends. Humans, for example, have an incredible capability and skill for empathy. They can still look at disparate and different pieces of information and have creative thoughts from that. They can see the future or envision what the future might look like. They use technological installation, management, and upkeep as something that they know how to do very, very well. Of course, humans are incredibly imaginative. They are good at building and creating strategies. And of course, the one skill that separates us from most of our artificial intelligent friends is the ability to critically think, to solve problems, and to identify new and exciting ways of, of delivering outcomes for an organization or a company. There's a great writer and researcher based over at the London Business School. Her name is Linda Groton, and she writes a lot about the future. And one of the things that Linda always says that I find very fascinating is that when you think about high performance in the future, humans are going to need lots of technical skill. They're going to need operational capability. They're still going to need basic analysis and analytical skills. They're still going to need physical skills to get things done. But they're also going to need all of these things that you see over there on the right. They're going to need adaptability and creativity, not to mention influence, drive, judgment a collaborative spirit, all those things on that list are important components of what performance will look like in the future. Now, for most of us, we know that artificial intelligence doesn't have, at least at the current, at the current time, a lot of those things that you see over there on the right. Those things are, in fact, 
uniquely human. And it's those things that when we put them together with artificial intelligence, we end up with a whole new idea around what we can do collaboratively and collectively together around high performance and human capability. We also know about the role of artificial intelligence in an evolving world of work. Well, what do we know about that? Well, let's think just for a moment about how much the world has changed just in the last three to four years as we've looked at the type and size of roles and responsibilities, what were, when, why, and how work has gotten done over the course of a global pandemic. And let's just face it, the nature of work as we know it, including all those things I just described, it's changing. And it changed more quickly than any of us ever anticipated. As a matter of fact, most of us think that the world of work and the agility of what were, when, how, and why work gets done shifted forward about 20 years in the space of the three years that we have for the global pandemic. So this is the context in which we have to think about the future, right? agility, flexibility, and the use of technology to bring those seismic shifts that we're predicting forward. Of course, in order to have those seismic shifts, one of the things that we absolutely have to think about is collaboration. So collaboration and the future of collaboration is one of those things that when we put it together, and think about it in the ways that we should be thinking about it, it's going to be very, very important that the connection between human capability and machine capability in the form of artificial intelligence is going to actually enable collaborative efforts for the future. 83% of corporations currently rely on technology for some type of collaboration in their workforces. 80% of them also believe that people who collaborate in teams produce more valuable outcomes. And 20 to 25% of those folks also will tell you that that collaboration improves worker productivity. So collaboration is one of those forces that's actually going to create all kinds of opportunity and upside uh, for us in the future if we do it right and, and think about it in the right ways. Of course, there are all kinds of new workforce models that are taking root. When we think today about what many companies are doing where they rely on a mix of traditional and full-time employees, not to mention artificial intelligent employees, and they're blending these things together in order to drive the growth. And as AI continues to mature and become more successful, you can look for that workforce model to add yet another branch onto the types of employees that we're looking at for the future, be they traditional employees or agile employees or AI employees. The workforce model of the future is a blend. And it looks completely different when you combine it with all of those types of things than what we might have necessarily have seen in the past. So just think about when you put all, the, all three of those things together, what it might be that you get. Now, if you think today about what some of the AI applications are out there, they're sort of operating already like humans, right? Today, for example, many of the times the technology that we're working with has a name or it has expectations attached to it, or we talk about it being down or being up or creating opportunities. But we know that if we use artificial intelligence well, we will have all kinds of future applications for things like training and onboarding and even correcting, course correcting and things like that, whether they create value down the line. So the mindset that we must have about thinking about AI as an employee already, it's already happening. It is already out there. And it's going to be entrenched in our organizations, in our work lives much sooner than you might think. Now, of course, all of this is going to create some very interesting leadership challenges and opportunities for us. There are some very interesting ways today that employers are already thinking about the role of leadership challenges and opportunities in the workplace. So what are some of those things? Well, think about this whole area of upskilling. Upskilling, new skilling, reskilling, everything that we're going to need to do in the future related to learning and development is going to be impacted by artificial intelligence. Matter of fact, as this gets more exciting and more useful, we're gonna to have to have an extremely broad adoption of upskilling and new skilling and reskilling in order to really be ready for the technological advances that are out there. And we're not just gonna get new skills, but we're gonna get a whole new mindset that's tied to this. When, when we think about AI as that kind of thing, that kind of coworker to whom we will hold to very specific tasks and responsibilities and skills and capabilities. Some numbers up here for you on the screen. 
A full 86% of employees globally will tell us that lifelong learning, this future of L&D, these cultures of learning are going to be very, very important for them in the future. Yet, nearly 40% of employees say their employees don't give them that already. So there's a gap there and one that we're going to have to continue to address if we do this particularly well. And let's not forget that employees are optimistic about artificial intelligence and particularly as it relates to an opportunity for them to learn as a learning tool, as capability. Matter of fact, in the perfect environment, artificial intelligence would help us as humans figure out where our own gaps are and would even be able to suggest ways for us to help fill those gaps and skill and competency capabilities that today we might not uh, get. So AI would actually give us that opportunity to leverage our enthusiasm, to upskill, new skill and reskill our workforces and prepare for tomorrow's challenges. And of course, gain an edge on our competition. After all, that's really what we wanna have happen. So there's also an ethical dimension of AI though. I think it's absolutely interesting. Over the long run, the AI helps us in some of the things that are challenging us in our society today. They help us create new opportunities. They give us broader impact for societal impact, for societal return. And it's important to realize that when we think about what artificial intelligence might, intelligence might do, it could actually free us up to go chase some of those things that are more important in our society today than simply uh, get, getting shareholder value. That's a unique opportunity I think that we don't want to miss. Of course, employees today, you know, the, so particularly the newer employees in the workforce are digital natives already. They have these distinct skills and capabilities. They are programmed toward action and immediacy, but that gives them a rather narrow view. So we have to ensure that as leaders, we're thinking about what these new imperatives might need to be. One of them at Sherm that we're paying lots of attention to right now is this whole idea that leaders in the future will have to help employees decompress, that they'll have to help them come up from their Zoom screens to resurface, to look at what's important, to get a new view of the horizon. And that we believe will help decrease opportunities for engagement, or increase opportunities for engagement, decrease opportunities for burnout, and give you alignment back where that it's important. Help employees decompress. We believe artificial intelligence has the capability to help us do that. And then there's this entire exciting world of neural leadership where that we're learning now more and more about how the human brain makes decisions and does problem solving. We used to think of those things being related in the brain. Now we're thinking of them as being completely separate. The same thing with innovation and creation, right? There's a different skill set utilizing different parts of the brain. We're now learning and, and people have different skills and capabilities on the innovative side, but also on the creative side. Of course, when we think about these leadership competencies for, that are going to be needed for the future, we also have to think about how artificial intelligence ties into those roles. And that brings us to what we think of as the future of artificial intelligence. So first, it's not time to panic. AI actually will fill the creation of more than 2 million net new, that's net new jobs in just the next three years. And that's more than likely to double by 2030. And remember the historical context we talked about a little bit earlier? It's nothing to fear because when these artificial intelligence opportunities get created because of the jobs that are out there, we also get with that new productivity, whole new skill sets that will be required for the future. And historically, that creation has resulted in GDP growth for countries, states, cities, and municipalities. It's resulted in employment growth globally, but also in countries and regions. And it's given us whole new skill sets that we never thought we would have been looking for just two, three, four, five years ago. I mean, as a human resources practitioner, if you'd have told me 15 years ago that I'd be hiring social media scientists and people who understood the, the, the whole metaverse uh, as part of job descriptions, I would have looked at you like you're crazy. So there is opportunity out there. And that shift that we're seeing, those changes that we're experiencing, they're just the start around the whole new world of jobs. And with all these new jobs, there's going to be entirely new occupations that are out there. Jobs that most of us probably have never even heard of. And today, those represent only a half of 1% of annual job growth in the U.S. But we really think that those numbers are going to start to climb 
really, really soon. And of course, there is an upside to all this growth, and that is increasing prosperity for the world. Now, we don't necessarily think that that prosperity is going to be equally distributed across all parts of the world, but we certainly can begin to think about that now. That's going to give us increased productivity. If we have increased productivity from this combination of human and artificial intelligence capability, that's a good thing. That drives economic growth. That drives GDP performance. That drives opportunity for all. So this great lifting of the ships with the tide is hopefully what we'll get from, a, from an increased use of artificial intelligence in the workplace. And let's not forget, we're probably going to get a little consumer side demand from that as well. So that means our expectations as consumers of what artificial intelligence will be able to give us is going to change as well. Matter of fact, I think one of the most important things we're seeing in the world of marketplace, marketplace of work today is the whole idea that personalization is going to continue as part of the model for what's going to be really effective to attract, retain, and engage employees, the human employees, for the future. So we do get, as human resources leaders, business owners, and others, we do get a greater impact for the future. And one of those is certainly greater efficiency. We know that today's tech can reduce time to fill for jobs, that we can look at new safety standards, that we can increase recruiter efficiency, that we can track onboarding and retention differently. There's all kinds of things uh, that we can do to think about this very, very differently. And I'm excited to be around in a time whenever we can do this. We can also look at AI to help us do other things too, like identify harassment and discrimination um, challenges that, uh, that might be missed. We can apply new tools. We get automated incident reporting. We get all kinds of exciting things happening out there just because of that we're adopting technology in the right way. So what do you do? How do you help think about this to shift your mind and change that paradigm? Well, the very first thing that you can do related to this, when you think about artificial intelligence, is to personify, to name it. Let's face it, all, most of you or many of you drive an automobile or have an automobile that you drive to work every day. That automobile is, in a, is like technology. And for this example, think of it as artificial intelligence for the future. You probably, that car probably has a personality. You may even have a name for it. You talk about its performance. You talk about when it's performing well, when it's not performing well. Think of that same construct in your automobile as you will for the future about the artificial intelligence that'll be working right beside you. It's not a lot different today than how we think about Alexa or Siri or any of the other tools that are out there for us. They have names and they do things for us. We count on them and rely on them. That's what's going to be important for the future. And by relying, by relying on them, we create performance expectations. We say, I expect my artificial intelligence to do X, Y, and Z. I expect my car to do X, Y, and Z. I, predict, or I want Siri or Alexa to do things in much the same way. In our workplaces of the future, we will have those things where we are creating those performance expectations and we will expect them to do well, to identify success and failures, to help us understand what's important. And we can talk about those types of tools and technology even artificial intelligence as being successful or not successful, as failures or as something that's capable of helping us be even more successful for the future. All right, so we're nearing the end. Two key takeaways. First, two slides of key takeaways. First, AI, artificial intelligence and humans, these are not diametrically opposed forces. These are complementary forces. In order to think of this this way, we have to change our own mindsets. Each enables the other. Artificial intelligence and humans working together make a great combination. Don't be frightened. AI will create far more jobs than it eliminates, both quickly and in the long term. And these jobs will hopefully help us do things that are more rewarding for us, that give us more opportunity to really in, to, to be creative, to be innovative, to, and require us to do fewer of those many menial roles or responsibilities that, that, we, that we've done in the past. And finally, AI-enabled tools will ultimately augment who we are as humans. It will make us better. It will give us superhuman skills and capability, the ability to predict, to understand, to be deeper into the data, to make better strategic decisions. And isn't that what all of our bosses expect from us? That capability. So we now have another tool, artificial intelligence, to help us get there. And then finally, what's in our future? Well, 
This is going to help us with the whole idea of equity. It's just not the equity that you're thinking of. It's the equity that will give us an outcome for a new employee and employer complete ecosystem. We see it coming. If we will get new experiences. These will be experiences and not jobs. And we'll look at networks to help us gain new opportunities out there. And lastly, but not least, let's think and ensure that we have this idea that enough of the technology is, we're gonna be surrounded by enough that we may have to decompress. We may have to come up to the surface as a new leadership competency to help us and our employees understand what's really important for now, but also for the future. That concludes what I had to say today. Thank you so much for joining and being with me. And now I'm going to hand it back over to you, Brittany, and to you, Lindsay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jim, for such an insightful presentation. Uh, we had quite a few questions come through. It looks like we could squeeze in at least a couple of those. Um, this one question asks, how do you get management and employees to trust AI? Yeah, it's that's a great question. And trust is one of those human components that we talked about, right? That um, was, uh, I didn't have it on the list particularly, but clearly it's a human outcome. I think trust develops with performance. And so if we develop very specific performance expectations of ourselves and the AI that we're using in our day-to-day -day work lives, the combination of those two things together, that's giving an, an outcome that's expected and then delivering upon that expectation, that builds trust. And I think that's the best place to start is by aligning what you actually can deliver with the use of the artificial intelligence and then delivering it and executing it. That's step one in trust. And I think there are many things you can do beyond that. But if you start there with actual performance outcomes, I believe that's the best place to begin. Great, thank you. And um, are you able to speak to whether or not um, or how the cost of AI will change in the next few years? Uh, we do. I didn't put it in the slide deck because um, uh, for a lot of reasons, but we all know that as technology and artificial intelligence becomes more mature, the price drops. So the newer things, the, the, the latest and greatest are obviously going to be a, a traditionally at a higher price point. And then as that comes into organizations today, the, the, the price point continues to go down because of its ubiquitousness, if that's a word, uh, because of its overuse or, or use in the, in the marketplaces. So we'll continue to see that. And I think that whenever you apply the use of technology out there, we already know in many organizations, for example, that the only thing stopping artificial intelligence from being even more prevalent or occurring more frequently in workplaces today is exactly what the questioner um, asked about, which is cost. That's the only thing that's really stopping the, the spreading even faster uh, than it is today. Great, and looks like we have time for at least one last question. Um, and I know you were just addressing cost for implementations, um, but would you, are there any like downsides to AI that um, you could address or what you think would be the, the largest downside? Yeah, I, I think the uh, most obvious one that we see in our human resources practice here at SHRM is when technology is not utilized effectively or the, the, the cost benefit analysis is not done well to help you determine um, the math behind the purchase or behind the outcome or behind the expectation. So I'm always looking for technology that can help give me data which can produce an insight, which will then be able or enable me to make better decisions or to make better uh, prognostications about what will happen in the future, better predictions about the future. And somewhere along that continuum I just described, when things get disconnected, that's when the, the, down, that's the downside of technology. So just like a human, it disappoints you, it, doesn't um, it, it doesn't set itself up for success. And instead, you feel like you've invested a lot and gotten very much back, in a uh, little back in return. And I think that's the biggest downside cost to, to any type of technology, including artificial intelligence. Excellent. Well, thank you so much again, Jim, for such an insightful presentation. That is all the time we have for questions. I also want to thank everyone who joined us for this fantastic thought leadership. This session, along with all of today's content, will be made available on demand following the event. Thank you again, Jim.